Recently, many celebrities have been seemingly coming back to God and religion. But what do we make of these events, seeing as the Bible warned us of the end times and an image of the beast? Today, we're going to unpack many cases and put the pieces together so that you aren't deceived by the coming image of the beast. Hey everybody, welcome to the show. This is the Dance of Life podcast and I'm your host, Tudor Alexander. Thanks so much for joining me today and being with me. I hope that you will share today's video with other people, especially people who are very wrapped up on the conservative side of things or in all of the things that we're talking about if they happen to really look up to any of the people I'm talking about today. Today's a very important topic and in fact, actually, I'm going to include this episode as part of my end time series, it's now episode number 35, I think. I don't plan on including more episodes in that series. I really don't. But today was just so important. So much information being gathered today and looked at. And it's it's more current events kind of stuff, which is going to complement very much the episode on the image of the beast and the second beast and the counterfeit spirit in my end time series. So I'm like, you know, I, I have to do this. I have to put it in my end time series I hate to add another episode, but at the same time, I don't hate it because these things are very important to discuss. Very, very important. We're talking about the image of the beast, and a lot of people do not realize what the image of the beast is. In my episode, in my series on the image of the beast, I talk, to, I talk about, about a lot of this stuff, and I'm going to link that series so that you can go watch it for free, ad-free, on my website, which, by the way, if you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe on my website, that is the best way for me to stay in touch with you. It's the way for you to watch all of my content ad-free when it comes out. And if you want to support me, that is the only way that I really intend on ever making money from my content. I don't want to use sponsors or gimmicky products or sell advertisements on any of my website or anything like that. I do not want to ever do that. And so Substack, because I have my own domain, has allowed me to basically create a membership program. It's only five bucks a month or 50 bucks a year, you can access all of my content that I've ever made. You can research all the health articles I've written. I'm a certified health coach. Um, a lot of good stuff, courses, books that I've written, all of it you can have access to as long as you're a member. And of course, it helps me to continue doing what I'm doing and provide you with unique content. So make sure you subscribe on the website. That's the best place to do it. I don't trust YouTube. I don't trust Rumble. I don't trust whatever other places this is at. But nonetheless, we are continuing, I guess, our end time series today, really. But we're talking about something very important, which is the image of the beast. A lot of people aren't aware of what the image of the beast is. And hopefully by today, if this is your first time jumping in and learning about these things, then you will be very, very much aware of it. I have so much stuff to cover today. It probably will be a longer episode, so make sure you use the tabs. I had two Chrome tabs because I usually accumulate things throughout the week and just like, okay, well, this, this goes here, this goes there. I had two Chrome tabs worth of stories that I want to cover. And it just happened to be that way. I literally like almost crashed my computer. I'm like, I have to have two subgroups for this topic. This is crazy. So we're going to get into a lot of stuff. But all of these things, look, these things are so important. What is coming on the horizon will deceive most people. I really hope you realize that. That's what the Bible says. And if God has decreed it, then it will happen. He has said that the image of the beast will deceive most of the people. People will take the mark of the beast. They will worship the beast. They will wander after the beast. The kings of the earth will give their power to mystery Babylon. This is an unavoidable reality. We are moving towards a one world order. It's not going to be the big bad left or the big bad, you know, communist dystopia that everybody thinks it is. It's going to be a one world religion. And that religion will be Catholicism. Or maybe it's going to have a new name. Who knows? I mean, ultimately, it's going to be a mystery Babylon, the Catholic religion. The Catholic system is what it is. It's the counterfeit. It's the counterfeit against Christianity. And again, I document all, if this is all news to you, look, big disclaimer, I am not against Catholics. I grew, I've said this before countless times. I grew up with Catholic schools. They were very good schools. I have Catholic friends. I went to a Jesuit high school, okay? This is my ring. 
It's from a Jesuit high school. It's not because I'm a Jesuit. It's because my grandmother got it for me as a reminder. And guess what? The ring says, follow me on it. And it's a reminder for me that Christ has always had his ha hand on my life. So that's why I wear it, if anybody's curious about that, because some people have asked me about it. But nonetheless, I went to a Jesuit high school. I grew up Eastern Orthodox. I was an altar boy. I have nothing against Catholics or people in institutionalized religion. In fact, I am the, the reason. One of the reasons why I'm doing what I'm doing is that, so that you wake up and you get out of that system. Revelation eighteen four. What does it say? It says, "Get out of her, my people, lest you share in her plagues, because her sins are heaped as high as heaven." And her, in this case, is Mystery Babylon, which is the Catholic system, the mother harlot, the mother of all the churches of which orthodoxy is one of the harlots, unfortunately. And again, I don't mean to ruffle people's feathers, but it is what it is. <clears throat> so today we're talking about the future, which is very, very, very much on the horizon. It's not, we're not talking like 100 years from now or 50 years from now. We're talking in this generation. If you don't believe me, watch my end time series. If you have watched my end time series, then you know the truth. But we want to look at some important scriptural context for all of the things we're going to be talking about today. Because the scriptures do not warn you, I should say, the scriptures, let me put it this way, the scriptures don't say, hey, things are going to get better, it's just going to get better and better, and the world's going to get Christianized, and there's going to be revival, optimistic, look up, kiddo, the scriptures do not say that. 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 5, this is about the uh, end times. Okay, there we go, I forgot to uh, hyperlink this, silly me. 2 Timothy 3, 3, 1 through 5. Godlessness in the last days. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness very much will apply to today's episode. Very much. But denying its power, what is the power that's spoken of here? It's the gospel, the power to change the human heart. That's what Paul wrote in another place. Avoid such people. But these are some pretty strong words for, for the people in the last days. And certainly they apply to our generation and the generations before. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 through 4. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And they'll turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. A lot of myths we're going to be looking at today. Jude 1 verse 4. Judgment on false teachers. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were des des designated for this condemnation, i.e. they were predestined to deceive so that they would weed out those who are elect and those who aren't. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our Lord into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. These people are part of the plan, folks. They're the villains that God wrote into the story. Now, I'm not saying these people, in, in terms of referring to the future people I'm talking about today that we're covering, maybe, who knows? I think a lot of the people I'm covering today, a lot of the celebrities, are just really deceived. But some of them, maybe they're in on it, who knows? Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. The man of lawlessness. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask your brothers not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or letters seeming to be from us, which is an interesting statement because people were starting to counterfeit Paul's letters. Already from the very beginning, there was a counterfeit. The mystery of iniquity. To the effect that the day of the Lord has come, let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion, or as King James translates it, I believe, says falling away. Yeah, falling away comes first. But a rebellion, there's no revival, there's falling away. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he may take his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Now, this has already been fulfilled in the papacy. And if you don't believe that, then watch my end time series. The real temple that all of the apostles, John, Paul, Peter, uh, Jude, James, all the people who wrote the New Testament believe that the temple was a spiritual reality that Christ created through his sacrifice. It's an indestructible temple. 
But if that's the case, who stepped into the temple and proclaimed himself to be God? Well, history tells you it's the Pope as a function. That is the man of sin. Of course, that function changes from individual to individual throughout their lifetimes, but that function is the man of sin. And that function has been revealed. So that means we're in the last days, and all of these things are for us. John 16, verse 2, but I, but I have said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. Oh, I'm sorry, wrong verse. They, they, put you, they will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. Now, the immediate audience of this was the disciples and apostles, which is true. They were, they were martyred, and people thought they were doing a service to God for, for killing them, just like they did with Jesus. But again, is that the only application? We're being conformed to the image of Christ. And if you know anything about history, in the last 2,000 years, the greatest persecutor of the saints is the power that proclaims to be, ironically, the one that is the true faith on earth and killed them in the name of God. So these things are all applicable to us, and they will be applicable at the very end when this counterfeit power enforces worship. And if you do not comply, they will kill you in the name of God, thinking they are doing a service to God. Revelation 13 also says the beast will be worshipped. There will be a worldwide government. A second power arises and deceives people into worshipping this beast. Um... Revelation 17, the kings of the earth give their power to this system. It's a worldwide New World Order situation. Matthew 24, Christ says there's going to be false prophets, false teachers, false Christs. They're going to deceive many. The love of many will grow cold. I mean, the Bible is very, like, very intentional on letting you know things are not getting better. They're not. They're getting worse and worse, and you're going to have deception there's going to be a lot of trickery. The devil has been working really, really hard, and he's working even harder as time goes on because his time is running short. Now, put all together everything I've just read to you, which is very plain, very obvious, very straightforward. Put that all together with what you see is happening and all of the things that we're going to be looking at as current events today. What you see is happening as people going back to religion, rediscovering God, and we're going to see if that's really the case. Going back to, quote, good old-fashioned values, conservative values, nationalism, return to religion, return to conservatism. All of these things that seem good, of course, they seem good in comparison to the crazy left, but that's the point. But all these things that seem good now put them in light of everything I just read to you from the Word of God, and what do you get? What you get is that the image of the beast is being built. The thing that seems good is actually the true evil that's on the horizon. It's not the evil that's being exposed to you as the big bad communist left that's coming to take your children. That's, that's the boogeyman that's designed to push you into the one world, the true one world religion. Because the boogeyman, that one's going to get destroyed. It's going to get judged by the other guys. Just like God used the Persians to judge the uh, Babylonians, he used the Greeks to judge the Persians, he used the Romans to judge the Greeks. All of those were pagan powers, and all of them got judged, but they were used to judge the previous. That's, what you're hap what's, that's what's happening now, that's what you're seeing. You're seeing the previous power, and really, of course, it's just two heads of the same snake, but you're seeing that power being revealed to you as the big bad evil that's coming to take over the world, and we're going to win. We the people. People are coming back to God. There's revival, you see. We're going back to good old things. And yet the Bible tells you that this exact sentiment is what you need to be careful for. The image of the beast is being, has been built for quite a while, but it's going to be completed in our lifetimes. And as you'll see today, this is exactly what's happening. All of these things are part of the false signs and wonders <clears throat> that the Bible warns you that the second beast, which is America, spoiler alert, is working to deceive people into building a representation of the first beast. What was the first beast? It was a Christian nationalist empire, a federation where the kings of the earth gave, gave their power to the church, for over 1,400 years. It started with Constantine. It evolved slowly, and by the 6th century, it was very much officialized. The Pope was the 
Grand Poobah, Pontifex Maximus, which is a title that the Roman emperors had. So you have to know your history. You have to know how these things come together because most of human history since Christ's ascension has been a Christian nationalist reality. Most of human history has been that reality. And the Bible says that they're, we're going to come back to that reality. The, the, the Reformation really put a thorn in the devil's side. And ever since then, we've been under the counter-Reformation to bring everything back to the Mother Church. Not through oppression, not through violence, but through seduction and invitation, and especially after Vatican II, with the creation of the charismatic movement and all of the things that are influencing today. So my goal today is that you wake up, that you wake up and see, first off, just how real this is and how close we are to Revelation 17. I want you to realize this is happening in our, in our generation. I'm not being an alarmist because everything I cover is documented extensively. If you've watched my series, then you know what I'm talking about. If you live in the United States and you are aware of these things, you must realize that this is where this system will begin. It will begin very likely when Trump comes to power, who knows, whatever the next person is. It's probably going to be Trump. But nonetheless, the light bearer will come and will shift the pole from dark to light. Of course, we're probably going to deal with a lot of drama until then. Who knows how it's going to play out? But this is the role of the United States, is to bring this false light to the world. I want you to know this stuff because I want you to not be deceived, first and foremost, and to get out of this system. Whether you're Catholic or Orthodox or you're part of the institutionalized religion situation, or you're, you're part of this mainstream Christianization of culture, and you love stuff like The Chosen or The Passion of the Christ or all the things I'm going to cover today. Now, I covered The Passion of the Christ, the first movie, in the actual episode of The Image of the Beast in my series. So today I'm going to I'm not going to cover that because there's a very deep dive that we do on that so you can see all of the occult nonsense that's in that movie and Catholic programming and just blasphemous things but ultimately look God uses everything for the good. I used to watch that movie and cry. I was like, "Oh my gosh, Jesus went through so much through us, for us." I didn't realize all the subliminal program. Now that I'm aware of it and God has opened my eyes, I don't watch that movie at all. I don't recommend it. But you see, God uses everything for the good. At the time, he used it to convict my heart. And I'm, I'm sure as he's used it for you, if you've seen it, and for other people who are elect and he's chosen to save and reveal himself to. But once you're aware, you realize, okay, you know, I don't, I don't need a movie to remind me of how much Jesus suffered. I have the Bible. <clears throat> I have the Holy Spirit to, to open my mind and bring me to that point of suffering with Jesus and, and thanking him for his sacrifice. But nonetheless, you got to get out of the system, whether you're part of institutionalized religion or you're part of this mainstream Christianization of culture. I'm going to be looking at a lot of stuff today. If you've touched on it, if you relate to it, if you like it, if you are involved with it, you got to get out of it, man. You got to get out of it. The devil has been extremely busy and he's getting busier and busier because again, his time is running short and many will be unfortunately fooled. So without, without further ado, first I want to bring to you the Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon. He has a very important quote, quote that I want you to commit to memory. Now, normally I don't really like quoting people so much because we have the word of God, but sometimes it's, there's a really nice way that people put things together. And this is an example. Discernment is not a matter of simply telling the difference between right and wrong. Rather, it is telling the difference between right and almost right. Very, very profound quote by Mr. Spurgeon, who was a great preacher, excellent preacher of his time, and had a lot of great things to say, especially about the beast and everything that it's up to these days. Now, this is a book called Jesuit Hollywood. Again, we're building the context now for all the things I'm going to show you. This is a book called Jesuit Hollywood, how the papacy and its Jesuits controlled Hollywood for decades and have continued to influence it ever since. It's by Sean Wilcock. It's uh, published in 2015 originally, I believe. And
Okay, I was having a hard time zooming in on this thing. So you can look this up. It's on Internet Archive. You could probably rent it from the library if you want or maybe listen to it. I'm not sure if it's an audio version, but it's a good book. It's a lot of stuff in here that you might want to learn about. Chapter 1, The Jesuits' Use of the Dramatic Arts. We're going to see some of this stuff in ensuing articles. Chapter 2, The Jews Create Hollywood. Chapter 3, Protestants, Roman Catholics, and Film Censorship in the Early Years. Jesuit Regulation of the Movie Industry. Joseph uh, I. Breen and the Code, The Roman Catholic Legion of Decency, The Golden Age, 1930s and 1940s, Rome Triumphant in Hollywood, Challenges to the Code and to the Roman Catholic Domination, Roman Catholic Movie Censorship Takes a Beating, Hollywood Liberalizes Under Jesuit Direction, yada, yada, yada. There's a whole history here that shows you the dark to light actually that happened, or I should say maybe the light to dark really is the, the right sequence, the light to dark that happened with Hollywood. Of course, if you know, Hollywood is a type of wood that was used to make wizards and witches' wands. That's what it's referring to because it's casting a spell. And who's famous for their theaters in Europe, which is the Jesuits. You'll learn about that in just a second. But I covered that in my end time series as well. So this should probably be a little good review for you if you've watched my series. Shakespeare and the Jesuits. At the Catholic Herald, the, the Clare... Claire Asquith considers the influence of the Jesuits on European drama. What has been sidelined for centuries, however, is the possibility that this blueprint was conceived not by Shakespeare himself, certainly not by his English predecessors, but, but by the acknowledged educators of Europe. The Jesuits, i.e. learning against learning, which is one of the main strategies of the Counter-Reformation. You can't beat people anymore with an iron fist. You have to find counter-narratives to change people's ideas and culture. Central to the revolutionary Jesuit system of education was drama. And that drama had certain qualities. It had to have a high moral purpose to win spectators from worldly vanity. But it was far from pious. Its intended audience was often influential and mainly secular and included both Protestant and Catholic noblemen and artisan. And what is, what is, by the way, what does the Bible tell you in Revelation 13? All kinds of people are going to come and worship the beast. Rich or poor, free or slave, doesn't matter. You're going to be forced to have to take the mark. An eager audience, as it turned out, who from the mid-16th to the mid-18th century packed the burgeoning Jesuit theaters across Europe from Prague to Messina, constantly demanding more and pouring money into ever more lavish productions. Isn't that interesting? Most people don't realize that Europe, especially after the... Reformation, basically the Council of Trent in the 1500s, all the way to like the 18th century, 19th century even, the theaters in Europe were Jesuits. They were the ones putting on all the drama and the plays and what's the next thing and oh my gosh. In fact, there's even a theory that Shakespeare was probably either a Jesuit or not even a real person, that he's just a fake persona created by the Jesuits. And they were writing all of these things to basically just seduce people into this, this, it's really, if you think about it, it's an extension of the Roman Colosseum, the Greek amphitheaters. These are Roman, Greco-Roman pagan things. Plato's cave, man. Very interesting. Plato predicted that in, what, two, 2,500 years ago or something? About just sitting there and watching an illusion while the puppet masters are basically playing with the shadows on the wall. Now, this is from a, a website that unfortunately could be better organized, but it's called Continuing Counter-Reformation. Rome's, Rome's response to putting learning against learning, according to Tupper Saucy, from Rulers of Evil, part, page 23. This is a book. It's called Rulers of Evil by Tupper Saucy. And again, it's another good book, just like Jesuit Hollywood. But let's see what it says. Just as Leo X's corruption had ignited Luther, Clement VII's shrewdness determined how the church would deal with the proliferation of Bibles. Clement was personally advised by the KG Niccolo Machiavelli, if you know who Machiavelli is, inventor of modern political science, and Cardinal Thomas Wolsey, Chancellor of England. Machiavelli and Wolsey opined that both printing and Protestantism could be turned to Rome's advantage by employing movable type to produce a literature that could that would infuse, diminish, and ultimately marginalize the Bible. Pay attention. Please pay attention to this. Cardinal Wolsey would later found Christ Church College at Oxford, characterized 
the project as to put learning against learning. So this idea of a counter narrative, you got to remember what is the political climate of the counter or the well the Reformation basically. You had the printing press, and you had the realization that they're under this system. So Bible started going out. You you can't control that. People were starting to learn the truth, wake up. It was a quote great awakening, a real great awakening, not a counterfeit one like what's happening now. Where people are awakening from, you know, the, the bad of the left to the false light of the right. It was a real great awakening. And so they had to change their strategy. You can't like try to grab running water. It doesn't work. So they had to figure out, okay, how can we infuse in culture a counter narrative that will discredit the word of God and and eventually seduce people back into the mother church. This was the this has been the plan for the last 500 years, folks. And part of that plan is something called learning against learning, which is people are learning the truth, so we have to create learning against that kind of learning. False teachers, false converts, all the things that the Bible warns you about in all the things that I read to you in the beginning. This is what the counter reformation is all about. Now, this is another important thing to keep in mind as we go forward. You can look this up, Church of St. Ignatius of Loyola, Rome, Sculpture, Luther, or any kind of combination. It's basically the Church of St. Ignatius of Loyola who started the Jesuits. And if you look at the picture, it's kind of hard. Let me see if I can zoom in here. Yeah, it's not wanting to do it, but you can kind of make it out. He's basically, this is a famous statue. You can look into it. He's trampling on Luther, holding a book that says, Ad Majorem de Gloriam, meaning for the greater glory of God. What does John 16, 2 say? The day will come when they will kill you, thinking they're giving service to God. Exactly pictured in this statue. He's Ignatius, is, meaning the Jesuits, are destroying the Protestants. And what is Luther holding? He's holding a book. Which is, what do you think? Is it his journal, his gratitude journal? Is it his address book? What book do you think he's holding? It's very clear. He's holding the Bible. So the Jesuits are telling you what their agenda has been since the very beginning. We will destroy Protestantism. We will destroy this idea that you can protest the mother church. And we will conquer what Luther began. Of course, Luther wasn't the only one, but he's symbolized in this statue. And he's holding the Bible. So the Jesuits are going to trample on Protestantism and on the Bible. Now, this statue is still up. It's not like it's been torn down. It's still up. It's in the Church of St. Ignatius, which Ignatius is not a saint, very far from it. But if you believe in a religion that honors the dead and you are the counterfeit, then of course you're going to raise the dead to positions of glory that they don't really have. So anyway, this is the death cult, but you have to be aware of these things. And with all of that context in mind now, let's begin with Jim Carrey. This is these are all kind of in order chronologically because these people have popped at different times, which is very interesting in and of itself. I don't know if that's been by design, but whatever. Jim Carrey was one of the first ones, a couple, several years, I think like 10 years ago or something. But let's read about Jim Carrey because he had sort of a turning around to God. And he was he was at this event and we're going to read about it. I believe that this room is filled with God. Carrie said while addressing formerly gang-involved men and women at Homeboy Industries in Los Angeles. There's a video about this. You can watch it. I didn't pull it up, but um, we'll read about it. He went, he went on to briefly reference his own personal struggles, then shared his thoughts on salvation. Hmm. Okay. You've made the decision to walk through the gate of forgiveness to grace, just as Christ did on the cross. So did Christ walk to forgiveness? Christ was righteous. He suffered terribly and he was broken by it to the point of doubt and a feeling of absolute abandonment, which all of you have felt. Then there was a decision to be made. And the decision was to look upon the people who were causing that suffering with compassion and with forgiveness. And that's what opens the gates of heaven for all of us. I wish that for all of you. I wish that for myself. Now, again, I'm not judging anybody's heart in this particular episode. There are maybe a few suspect ones here. But... We have to be aware of what's happening. Just because 
somebody is trying to do something doesn't mean that they shouldn't be scrutinized. Jim Carrey obviously needs some study with his Bible because forgiving people is not what gets you into heaven. It's being forgiven that gets you into heaven. Of course, we're going to be here on the earth, but nonetheless, it's being forgiven that enters you into that reality. How are you forgiven? By repenting and having faith, not by forgiving others. Of course, that's part of a Christian walk. Of course it is. But it's not something that you do and decide upon that determines your salvation. It is your faith in Christ, and ultimately the Bible teaches that that faith is given to you by God according to his discretion, because he doesn't give that to everybody. So if you have faith in God, give glory to God today. Be grateful, because most people will be deceived and they'll take the mark. But moving on. In fact, in his 2009 keynote talk for Global Alliance for Transformational Entertainment, Kerry spoke about Jesus and specifically his puzzlement concerning how he saved the world from sin. He, quote, he freed the world from sin from his perspective. From his perspective? It's up to each one of us to free the world from sin, from our own point of view. And with that comes freedom. Are we talking of the same Jesus and the same gospel? Or is this some New Age Gnostic gospel going out into the world? Now, again, I don't know what in Jim Carrey's heart. Certainly not now, because this is a little bit after this article. But Jim Carrey came from, you know, the Hollywood crowd. He's very much in the New Age, all kinds of stuff. And I'm not judging, because I was too. I, I get it. I know that world very well. But obviously, you, you're not getting the gospel yet, my friend. Let's continue. At the end of Carrie's talk at Homeboys, he brought up another theological doctrine, that of omnipresence. As you will see, his interpretation certainly doesn't line up with scripture. Quote, they talk about omnipresence in church and nobody really thinks about what that means. What it means is every cell of our body is God. Everything is God. Everything is divine. Oh, does that sound like the gospel or does it sound like somebody, somebody else that you are just like God? This is new age stuff, guys. In a 2004 interview on 60 Minutes, Carrie led correspondent Steve Croft to it. Now, this was 20 years ago, so just making sure that that's kept in mind. We don't want to be too harsh on Jim Carrey. But nonetheless, I want you to, to see the patterns. We're going to put all these things on a board so that you can see what's really happening in culture as a whole. That's the point. It's not about putting Jim Carrey up and, and you know criticizing him to death. It's really, I want you to see this as a pattern. In 2004 interview on 60 Minutes, Carrie led correspondent Steve Croft to a secluded place on his property where he goes to, quote, hang out with Buddha and Krishna and, you know, all those guys. When Croft asked Carrie if he was a Buddhist, Carrie replied, I'm a Buddhist, I'm a Muslim, I'm a Christian, I'm whatever you want me to be. It all comes down to the same thing. You're either in a loving place or you are in an unloving place. If you're with me right now, you cannot be unhappy. It's not possible. Just try. So he was, at that point in time, obviously, Carrie was just very confused. And again, I feel for him. I've been there myself. Believe me, I'm not judging. But ultimately, when you have people like Jim Carrey, who are coming into the spotlight, talking about salvation and Jesus, and not pointing them to the truth, this is in fulfillment of what the Bible warns you of. So let's pray for Jim Carrey that he does find the truth and abandons all this new age mumbo jumbo. This is now a favorite of people's Jordan Peterson, the, the conservative, the guy who just knows what to say, the guy who's got his head on his shoulders. Jordan Peterson. Let's read about Jordan Peterson and see what's up. Jordan Peterson is not known for being shy about his opinions. Yet the most influential biblical interpreter in the world today, which we're going to look at an article of, is very coy about saying whether or not he believes in God. This is, by the way, from August of 2021. So we're going to see Jordan Peters Peterson's uh, journey. I don't like the question, Peterson always replies when put on the spot, acknowledging that he is obsessed with religious matters. Several millions of people can attest to that, having watched his fascinating, quote, the psych psychological significance of the Bible stories. YouTube series, with focuses on the book of Genesis. But when it comes to God's existence, Peterson doesn't want to declare his hand. Why? I don't know exactly, he replies. I act as if God exists, and I am terrified that he might. Some think, some think Peterson is being deliberately shifty. 
As a result of the professor's engagement with religion, a full-length study on the question of him and God has been published called Jordan Peterson, God and Christianity, The Search for a Meaningful Life. In it, Christopher Cackshore and Matthew R. Petrusek, a couple of American academics, generously acknowledge that all, he, all that he has done to draw out the psychological insights of biblical narratives, while seeking to encourage him over the line into what they think is full-blown belief. Both admire Peterson, but just can't quite get over the fact that he's unwilling, at least publicly, to make what they take to be the ultimate declaration of faith. His faith, they say, don't worry, it's coming, by the way. The declaration of faith is coming. It's going to be Catholicism. You'll see. His faith, they say, is the sort of thing you might have, quote, in the parking lot outside the church, as if he's nearly there, but not quite. Yeah, they're working on him. The Jesuits are working on him. Don't worry. You can sense their frustration throughout. Is acting as if God exists enough to be counted as believing Christian? Close, they think, but not close enough. Yeah, so Peterson is, this is in 2021, so it's a couple years ago. And he's been going through a journey, and let's let's see where that journey is leading. Jordan Peterson on Adam and Eve. This is the one I was talking about with uh, that. It, that would, it was cited that he's you know one of the top biblical expositors. This is from 2018. It was cited in the previous article. In his biblical interpretation, Jordan Peterson represents represents in powerful and fresh ways the stories that have animated Western culture. Hmm. Christians have much to learn from him even as his own engagement with the Bible could be enriched by the Christian tradition. Well, what tradition are we talking about here? Because really, there's only the gospel. Then there's tradition, which is Catholicism. Very interesting. The most influential biblical interpreter in the world today is not a pastor. It's not a scriptural scholar or a bishop. He's a Canadian clinical psychologist with no formal training in biblical studies and no church membership. Interesting, isn't it? Jordan B. Peterson's best-selling book, 12 Rules for Life, An Antidote to Chaos, is biblically saturated. It draws from his immensely popular YouTube series, The Psychological Significance of the Bible Stories. Committed atheists rave online about the wisdom Peterson has shown them in the Bible. Isn't this interesting? Fascinating to me. Again, in light of all that you know that the Bible warns you about. And countless report that their lives have been changed for the, for the better by his work. Peterson holds that the scripture is an unimaginably ancient and profound source of wisdom and refined through the ages from the collective human imagination. Really just beautiful words, but what do you really believe about scripture? Through time, these ancient stories have been shorn of all superfluity so that each phrase is saturated with meaning. It's true that the word of God is incredibly saturated with meaning, but it's also the truth. It's not just a story, which is very profound. And any story retold for thousands of years captures something enduring about the human condition. So you see, for Jordan Peterson and for the people who follow him, he's not leading them to the gospel. The Old Testament and the book of Genesis, of course, Genesis is the first book. So it's revealing to you the plan. The, God says in Isaiah 46.10, I declare the end from the beginning. If you understand typology, if you understand that God works in pictures, living pictures, then the book of Genesis is full, and really the whole Bible, the Old Testament, but the book of Genesis is full of pictures of declaring the end from the beginning. Adam and Eve and God in paradise on the Sabbath is a picture of Christ resting with the bride for eternity in paradise, in a renewed creation. God is saying, look, guys, on the seventh day, this is what history will boil down to at the very end. We got a long way to go until then, but this is what it's going to boil down to. You and me in paradise forever. But again, these things point you to redemption, to Christ, to the need for a savior because we fell from that picture. But if you're just looking at it from the hero's journey and all of these you know, secular perspectives, you're not helping people be saved. And this is why this is part of the false teachers, false prophets, all those things that the Bible warns you about, where people are what? itching ears, and seeking after myths. Now, of course, I'm not saying the Bible is full of myths. I'm saying that the interpretations and all these stories of men and philosophies, these are myths. These are the fairy tales that people love to hear because it doesn't convict them. The fact that atheists are all about Jordan Peterson's interpretation of the Bible should show you something very important. Because atheists hate people who stand up for the gospel and tell them to repent. 
because God is going to judge you and destroy you when he returns. So if they love Jordan Peterson's interpretation of the Bible, what does that mean? That means he's not actually giving them the gospel because the book the gospel convicts you. You can either reject that conviction and say, you know what? No, I'm not guilty. I don't believe in God. Or you say, I, I am guilty. But God, please wash me clean. Forgive my sins. One of the two. It's, it's the cut. The sword cuts. It's sharper than any, any two-edged sword. The sword cuts through everything, meaning it divides. You see the point? It's the, the word of God, when used rightly, it divides. That's what Jesus said. I came to bring the sword. What's the, what's the sword? The sword is the word of God that divides people. You either, you, once you get the word of God, you either are going to be upset or you're going to repent and turn your life around. One of the two. There's no option. So if something is being given to you and everybody's like, oh my gosh, I'm an atheist, but I love the way that you talk about the Bible. It's just so great. You're not actually talking about the Bible. Isn't that interesting? But that's Jordan Peterson. That's the, you know, article from 2018. There's more to talk about Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson and his useful God. This is in uh, two years ago. Well, a year and a half ago, 2022, July. Another article to read, very important stuff. Peterson is a man for whom the human endeavor takes center stage. The human story. But therein lies the problem. You see, it becomes clear to me that for Peterson, the human story is indeed the human story. Or to be more precise, it's a story about optimization of each individual human in this life. He argues that the foundational human task is the consistent moving of our lives, of our very selves upward. Does this sound like something that you've heard before? Maybe in the book of Genesis. Chapter 3. Not upward towards God, upward towards self-improvement and betterment. Peterson emphasized this visually, placing his arm diagonally across his body to evoke an uphill journey. So this guy basically went and attended one of Peterson's, you know, very popular lectures, and he's writing about it. That's the context. Moving on. We are to each take responsibility to become more than we currently are. The human task is to spend their life optimizing. That's what Jordan Peterson believes we have to do. And the Bible is a great tool for that because there's a lot of stories about the hero's journey and, you know, struggle and, and getting better and all these things, which again has nothing to do with what those stories were actually written, which is to point you to Christ, the Messiah. That when Christ came, he fulfilled all of these pictures. Boom, 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 boom. He's like Abraham. He's like Moses. He's like Joseph. He's like, you know, Adam. He's like, you know, et cetera, et cetera. David, Solomon. All those people that you saw are foreshadowing a particular aspect of Christ. So when he shows up, it's like, oh, boom, 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 boom. He's, he's the final puzzle piece that actually makes the picture, if that makes sense. This is another one. This is actually from a Catholic site. Notice the crusader in armor that they have, militant Catholic paraphernalia as usual. But this is called The Theology of Jordan Peterson, and it's dated February 10th, 2023. So now we're moving forward in time. The controversial Canadian psychologist Jordan Peterson has a notoriously complicated relationship with the question, do you believe in God? He famously claims that I act as if God exists, while treating God as such a transcendently obscure concept that merely affirming or negating his existence would be crass. So he's a little agnostic. He doesn't really know yet. He will, don't worry. This troubles religious people and atheists alike, many of whom would like Peterson to man up and take a stand. Tell us what you really think, bucko. And yet the Canadian psychologist has been associated with renewed interest in religion and in Catholicism in particular. Didn't I tell you? It's going to come. It's going to come around and you will see it. He will be one of the spokespeople for the new thing. Jordan Peterson Catholicism. Just type that into Google. See what you get. Let's see what you get. Although he has never publicly confirmed that he is a believing or practicing Christian, Peterson, summarizing Carl Jung, has called Catholicism, quote, this is a quote now, as sane as human beings can get. Hmm. But he also suggested that he, what he sees as laxity in practice beginning in the 1960s is an ongoing failure on the part of the church. Not, whatever, I'm not going to continue it. But he basically says, well, you know, before 1960, kind of like Mel Gibson, who has the same things to say, oh yeah, before the Vatican, you know, that's true Catholicism. You mean Catholicism that was ruling with an iron fist and persecuting people and putting people to fire for not obeying 
banning the Bible, meaning making people not be able to read the Bible, changing the Word of God, perverting all kinds of doctrines, killing people, legislating days that you need to worship and rest on. You mean that power is, quote, as sane as human beings can get? Jordan Peterson, for all his intellect, either, two choices now. Look, you got only have two choices. You have to be honest with yourself and put aside your emotions if you idolize this person. Put aside your emotions. There are only two choices here because he's a very smart person. He's very intellectual. Obviously, he knows his history. He's a professor. He's been in the academic world for a very long time. So you only have two choices. When he says a statement like this, that is so grossly ignorant of history, you have only two choices. Either he is exceedingly ignorant, which would be very strange for somebody who's as smart as Jordan Peterson, to, to, to say some as sane as human beings can get, really? With the millions of people that the Catholic Church basically condemned and persecuted and tortured over the, over the centuries, especially they were mostly believers, as sane as human beings, he goes, that's a grossly ignorant of history. Or, number two, is that he's being influenced by the Jesuits. And again, we, we looked in my series at the Art of War, how one of the tactics, look, the Jesuits have two tactics, either search and destroy and poison to death, or seduce with praises, with gifts, with laureates of various kinds with commissions with all these different tools to prop people up in the previous episode i looked at um, ecumenism and the one world religion that's coming where the pope is giving these honors like papal knighthood to various muslim scholars all of these things are just seductions when when the book of revelation says the the mystery babylon is just the wine of her fornication where the kings of the other have committed spiritual adultery with her these are, this is what it's talking about, is these little flirtatious involvements. Oh, we're going to give you an award. Just do this thing for us. And, you know, this and that. This is spiritual adultery. You're compromising your values for the sake of being exalted and given various benefits. So Jordan Peterson only has, there's only two options. And again, I'm not saying which one it is because I don't have enough information to really confirm or deny but really, this is the only two options. Either, Jordan, you are very, very ignorant of history, which would look very poorly upon you as an intellectual to say something like that. Or you are being influenced by the Jesuits, which is a very big possibility, considering that he's so warming up to Catholicism. Now, another important detail that you should know is that Jordan Peterson's wife is Catholic. Tammy Peterson's conversion story, finding God amid the ordeal of illness. Now, Again, this is an important Fennec Fox moment. If you don't know what a Fennec Fox is, it's one of the coolest animals there is. Little tiny, cute little fox. Looks like it's from a cartoon, but it's got giant ears. You got to be like that Fennec Fox when you hear certain terms. This is the key. And when you see something like finding God, okay, because they never say Jesus, they say finding God. This is going to be a theme today in all the stuff we're looking at. Finding God. Do you remember when the, the polls, when John, uh, Saint, um, what's his name? John Paul the, the II went and spoke to Poland before communism was basically went from dark to light in Poland? What are the people there? I don't know how many people were there. Hundreds of thousands. I don't know. A lot of people. Giant stadium full of people. We want God. We want God. What were they, what were they actually saying? Do they want the gospel and Jesus? No, they wanted religion. They wanted religion back because communism was such a big, bad, bad cop, such an evil cop that the good cop sitting there in his brilliant white robes and smiling and giving them a little benediction of a hand wave or peace blessing or whatever he's doing, he just looks so good. We want God back. No, you want religion back. So when people say finding God, when we look here and it says finding God amid ordeal of illness. Now look, I'm sorry that she went through illness, but she didn't find God. She found Catholicism. The wife of celebrated psychologist Jordan Peterson soon to be received into the Catholic Church. This is as of November 6th, 2023, last year, a couple months ago. She's already Catholic. 
discusses the life-changing experience that led to her conversion. Now, look, I'm going to give a qualifier that we do not know the heart of people. God can work through people even if they have poor theology. Absolutely. I don't make a question about whether she's truly saved or not. I don't know. I really don't, and neither do you. But the point is that she found Catholicism, and that should be worrisome. At the very least, it should be worrisome for many reasons, because it's not the truth. This is what the the Bible warns you about. So she will be one of the people that will take the mark, meaning she probably wasn't saved if that's the case. But we don't know. Maybe she'll wake up another level in times to come. But she's also influencing Jordan Peterson, her husband. And Peterson is warming up to Catholicism. So what's what's what do you think is the likely outcome here is the question. The likely outcome is not that Jordan Peterson is slowly going from dark to light, from the atheism of academia that he was in, being brought into the light of the church. Because it's the, as sane as you can get, people. It's as sane as you can get. Now imagine all of the people that just love Jordan Peterson because he's so good at talking about stuff. He's just such a good storyteller. He's a very brilliant man, but unfortunately his brilliance is being used by the Jesuits. Whether indirectly or directly, who knows? Nonetheless, imagine now that Jordan just gets over that edge. All these years he's slowly, oh, I don't know, I don't know, and then suddenly he makes the jump into Catholicism. What's that going to be like for culture, I wonder, where he's openly telling, you know what, this is the real deal. Let me tell you why. And it's this and this and this. And he seduces you with all these brilliant philosophies and ideas as to why Catholicism is the answer. It's as sane as you can get. Do you see where this is going? This is one story, folks. Actually, it's the second story we did today. But it's just one story. And there are many, many such like this that are popping in culture. And you're going to see. And this is why the image of the beast is ready to be finished. And why most people will be deceived by it because they don't have discernment and they don't know their history. Okay, our next guest is comedian J.P. Sears, which everybody loves and knows as well. Let's see, this is from March of last year. So again, these are recent. Comedian J.P. Sears talks about how his perspective about God has been changed. Again, notice how they don't say Jesus. It's always God. And God is a nice way for them to sneak in Catholicism or the one world religion. Let's see what J.P. Sears has to say. I was, ex and he made a video, this famous video, I think a couple, yeah, like a year ago, approximately. I was excluding some amazing traditional Christian values, beliefs of God and ways of connecting with God that I now really value. Hmm. So some traditional Christian values. What is that? Beliefs of God. What is that? Ways of connecting with God. What is that? Are you talking about going to church and getting communion at a Catholic church? Is that a way of connecting with God? Are we talking about praying? What are we talking about? Seeing the presence of evil, that's why I've just accidentally been getting more Christian. Now, if you know all the things that I've talked about, if you understand the dark to light mechanism, this is what's happening. The evil, now again, I don't know the ultimate story of J.P. Sears' heart. I don't know, and neither do you. But from the outside, as you judge somebody by their fruits and their works and what they believe and say, it starts to paint a consistent picture. Seeing the presence of evil, that's why I've just accidentally become more Christian. You've accidentally become more Christian because you're seeing the evil. What evil are you talking about, J.P.? What's the evil in the world that is being exposed to you right now? Is it the evil of idolatry that people are idolizing Trump and gold and frothing at the mouth for a golden age to come? Is that the evil you're talking about? Of course it's not, because that's the evil that you're part of. You're talking about the evil of the left, of the woke left that is all about the liberal agenda. You're talking about that evil that's being exposed to you, because that's what he's all about. He's constantly making fun of those people. And he's funny for sure. God has given him the gift of humor. But that's the evil he's talking about. So do you understand now what he means when he says seeing the presence of evil, i.e. the liberal left? That's why I've just accidentally become more Christian, i.e. it's pushed me towards the right. And I'm discovering all these Christian values that are just so useful. 
that I didn't know I had. Why so many other people, why so many other people are? Because right now I think the evil that's in the world, i.e. read it as the liberal left, atheistic, communistic, dark, that is designed to push you to the right towards religion, is doing a great service of driving a lot of people <laughs> to find God in ways that they previously hadn't. You're right, it is doing a great service to the beast. That's the point. That is the point of the left. Don't you get it? This whole dialectical party system was started with the French Revolution. If you haven't seen that episode, go watch it. I think it's episode 14. The dialectical system is designed to bring you back to the mother church in a way that you feel it's natural and good because the bad cop is really bad. He's very obviously evil. Then the good cop comes in. He's nice and clean cut. He's smiling. He's like, hey, forget that bad cop. Come with me for a second. Then, of course, you go with the good cop. But you don't realize that they're both cops. This is the tactic that's playing. And... If you don't recognize that the side that is coming to rescue you is actually the true evil that the Bible warns you about, then you're still in the dialectic. Moving on. I'm looking at these Christian values and they make way more sense to me now than they previously did when I was more liberal, i.e. in parentheses. Christian values around faith in God, Christian values around family first. And I now believe that the power of prayer is the most important thing you and I can do. Of course, prayer is very powerful. I believe prayer is powerful. I believe prayer brings about change. I believe prayer brings God into a place where God is needed. Some good stuff, but again, what is he really referring to? Family first, conservative values, nationalism maybe, Christian nationalism maybe, inching their way towards that reality. One more thing. I'm delighted to say now that I have not only, to, not only no shame about saying God, but I actually have joy in saying God. Well, good, JP. I will encourage you to go one step further and say Jesus. Because even the demons believe in God. That's what the Bible says. But they shudder. They don't worship God. They don't rejoice in God. They don't rest in God as their Savior. They believe in God. Of course they do. So believing in God, general sense, isn't the first or isn't the full way to get there. A lot of people believe in God but aren't saved. You have to trust in Christ. And that's the direction that I hope you will find and not just be lost to the superficial results of having a religion. This is, this is the problem. They're conflating worldly outcomes with faith. Oh, well, there's a lot of good Christian values like, you know, family first, Oh, sure, that's all great. But if you don't actually have a trusting relationship with Christ, you're not saved. None of that stuff will matter on the day of judgment. So all these warm and cozy feelings of conservatism that Christianity brings, because of course Christianity is naturally conservative. God made us to be conservative. Why? Because we're made in his image. Don't kill, don't steal, don't lie. These things are, are conservative by nature. You're conserving energy because you're representing God. But conservatism is not faith in Christ. Sure, it's good to have conservative values, but if you don't have faith in the gospel, you're not saved. And this is the thing to keep in mind. Okay, this is from the Christian Post, and I highlighted it because the way that they worded it was very interesting. This is from Joe Rogan and Aaron Rodgers. On his podcast, they had an interview, and the Christian Post comments it, on it like this. It says, Joe Rogan and NFL star Aaron Rodgers recently discussed the crucial role Christianity plays in an increasingly chaotic society, i.e. liberal society, i.e. the woke left coming to take your children. We need what? We need Christianity back. Well, what is Christianity? Christianity is not a denomination. Christianity is the gospel. But you see, if you believe Christianity means religion, there's how they get you. In the need for Jesus' return in an episode of the Joe Rogan Experience podcast. So Joe Rogan is also warming up to God, to the Bible, to Jesus. Now, again, I don't know his heart, but certainly this is in the culture now. We need, what does it say? We need Jesus. This is a little more direct, but again, read it in context. What does this mean? Is this a charismatic Pentecostal revival type of we need Jesus or... We need Jesus because we're sinners and we're dead in our sins, kind of. We need Jesus. Very big difference. 
because the first one is very man-centered. We need Jesus, meaning we need those cool concerts and Christian stuff to make us feel good and, you know, conservative values and family first and awesome worship songs. Yeah, we need Jesus. Or we need Jesus because we are dead in our sins. We are completely unworthy of existence. And yet God is sustaining us every moment, even though we've lied and cheated and stolen and fornicated and used God's name blasphemously. I'm dead in my sins. I need Jesus to pay for my sins. Which one is it? And of course, it's probably the first. But who knows? We'll see. Time will tell. But these are in the culture. They're getting dripped here, there. All the influencers are starting to talk about it. This is the point that you have to keep realizing. Now, this is another interesting phenomenon. This is if you look up... Um, Candace Owens tries to convert Andrew Tate back to Christianity. Very fascinating phenomenon happening with Andrew Tate as well. And we're going to watch a video in just a second. But, of course, these are one of the images that Pogus says, I will make him a Christian again. Gosh, this is so fascinating, especially if you realize the fact. Oh, there's so much to talk about with this. If you've seen my episode on Islam and how Catholicism created Islam, this is... Again, Islam, like communism, is a dark-to-light situation. Islam will be reintegrated to the Mother Church. Islam is not the power that's going to step into the temple and proclaim itself to be God. Islam is not the power to worry about. Catholicism is, and Catholicism created Islam. Muhammad was a pope puppet. He was sponsored by the Catholics and propped up. He was surrounded by Catholic converts and Catholics. I talk about all that in my End Time series and in other places, too. But the point is, Andrew Tate, who is all, like, all the dudes love Andrew Tate. He's on the edge. He's just in your face. He doesn't care about what he says. He just says it like it is, quote unquote, very much for the right. Like, yeah, he's masculine. He's not some pansy. A lot of people, he's a very in your face figure, very controversial, very in the culture. And he's Muslim. And now there's this push, hey, Andrew, come on back to Christianity. Come on, i.e. Catholicism, really, what's going to happen? Can you imagine? We're going to watch a video in just a second, but can you imagine, just like with Jordan Peterson, when they flip Andrew Tate to being a quote-unquote Christian or Catholic, how militant he is for Islam, and they can just point that energy towards Catholicism. And now he's going to rally all the white guys, all, everybody, really, every, every male under the sun. Doesn't matter if you listen to Andrew Tate and you admire him. And he starts speaking about religion and God and, of course, how he found Jesus. But it's not really the Jesus of the gospel. It's the Jesus of Catholicism. And he starts being a proponent of that. Can you imagine the effect on culture for the image of the beast? It's really fascinating. But we're going to listen to this... Uh, video of him okay i had to figure this out because it was being it was misbehaving but let's watch it we're christian and you know i definitely do not know enough about the islamic faith to sit here and debate you on it i'm never a person that will debate somebody on something that i'm not an expertise on yeah. but i will say that i'm sad that you're not a christian anymore and i i can sense perhaps it's because you felt that christians weren't doing a good job defending their beliefs yeah i think that god should be feared i fear god it's one of the only things i fear if i went to an islamic country i felt god you don't feel it he felt God in an Islamic country. What is God to you? God should be feared. Of course God should be feared, but God is love. God is the gospel. God is Jesus Christ that invites you to repent and be forgiven so that you can be free. God is love. So if you feel God when you go into a place that is all about authoritarian submission, boy, that's something. Any God? How is it a Christian country if Satanists are mocking Jesus on the street? <laughs> Do you streets? see what he did there? I understand what you're saying. If you're thinking that America is a Christian country, Christianity is getting it wrong. Yeah. And the truth is that America is no longer a Christian country. We're being run. No, America was never a Christian country. But you know. by people that are satanic, Hollywood is satanic, and Hollywood is running America. Oh, so you're not God. wrong. But I think that right now America is facing a spiritual battle, and for the first time in a very long time, Christians are starting to stand up and speak about our principles. I hope so. And I could have used you. <laughs> <laughs> we could have used you, man. Do you do you see what's going on? 
gosh, there's so much. You could spend a whole episode on just this particular thing. We could have used you, man. Oh, honey, see, he's, we're both chuckling with each other, warming up. What's the problem they're pointing to? The problem they're pointing to is the big, bad, obvious, evil, liberal left that is just parading with little devil costumes, which, by the way, the devil is not some red horned, you know, goat man. The devil, what, is the, what does the Bible tell you that the devil looks like or appears as? 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4, I believe, or I'm getting that one wrong. That's blind. He's blinded the minds of my believers, but he's blinded the eyes of, my, of unbelievers because, or the minds of unbelievers, because he's an angel of light. He appears as an angel of light. He doesn't appear as some big, bad, scary demon with horns and hooves and red and stung t- tongue sticking out and, you know, pitchfork. That's the obvious evil. They're Satanists. You see, they're both coming together over what? What are they coming together over? Over the dark. Yeah, that bad cop is a really... He's just he's just turned this country, this Christian country, which, by the way, it was never a Christian, it was never a Christian country. Watch my episode on the second beast. It was never a Christian country. The Protestants were Christian, or the, uh, sorry, the Puritans were Protestants, which are Christians, but America was not a country. When America became a country, 100-something years later, it was taken over by Luciferian Freemasons that were not born-again Christians. Very much documented in my episode on the second beast. But America, this is what how they get you. America was a Christian nation. And then, you know, these evil communist leftist Satanists, we, yeah, we can both agree that no, that's Satan for sure. He's, he's the enemy here. We got to get back to Christian values. Aren't you going to help us, Andrew? Aren't you going to help us take out this big, bad, evil left? Because God should be feared, right? Imagine now, Andrew Tate converts to Catholicism. And he takes all of that militant energy and helps you defeat the left. And we're all rising together. And yes, you, to be a man like Andrew, you got to be a Catholic. Oh my gosh, these things are just so easily connected. They really are, if you really understand your history. But here's something interesting to put to mind and to heart. National Justice Investigates. Rising Republican Party influencers got their start at talent agency run by Israeli pornographer. Did you know that? They're prominent guests on Fox. They had lead they lead grassroots rallies, grassroots rallies. Keep in mind counter-reformation, learning against learning. They write columns at the Blaze. They are keynote speakers at CPAC. A few were even used to blackmail perceived enemies of the Israeli interests. And they all got their start as actors and models at the same Israeli-owned talent agency. It's all one big club, and you and I are not part of it. These up-and-coming conservative superstars appear to have had or currently still have active profiles up at at a shadowy Israeli-born pornographer Ami Shafir's Explore Talent, National Justice Can Report. It it tells you who these people are, like Lauren... uh, Lauren Boebert, but Candace Owens is number one on this list, who began producing professional conservative content months after launching her Explore Talent profile in 2017. So all of these people are groomed and put forward as the next new thing. We need, there's a narrative, which is the old narrative, the left, the legacy media. We need the fresh face of the conservative right. We need the light to come out. All the right people, meaning the right on the right side, like Candace Owens, like, um, oh, what's his name? I can't think of his name right now. I've talked about him before, but there's so many of them. They all are nice, clean cut, fresh faces. They seem to be reasonable, much more reasonable than the left. That's being presented to you as the other option. And that option looks very good in light of the crazy left, because that's the whole point. The point is to take you from one side to the other. But all of them got their start in the same place. So keep that in mind. Let's talk about Shia LaBeouf. LaBeouf, however you pronounce the last name. Shia LaBeouf confirmed into the Catholic Church. Considers becoming a deacon. Gosh, isn't that interesting? Another celebrity conversion to Catholicism. Who is influencing people and very much in the public eye. The actor converted to Catholicism after filming Abel Ferrara's Padre Pio. So that was his initiation his occult initiation into the mystery religion. And it's very sad. We should pray for him that he experiences Jesus really and fully and leaves that system. But this was early this year in January. 
And of course you see him. I just, I look at him and honestly, again, I'm not judging people's heart, but what I see when I look at his face and some of these, like, look at his face. It's just so, his eyes are full of sadness. They really are. They're just, to me, they're just very empty. Look at that. Can this, yeah, see, it's not, uh, it doesn't take the, the shade off of it. But if you just look at his eyes, they're just, they're just so full of sadness to me. They're just, it's like, you're not, you're not in the truth, bud. You got to get out of the system. Shia Le, speaking with the Catholic news agency, LeBeouf's confirmation sponsored brother Alexander Rodriguez said that the actor wants to become a deacon sometime in the future. So he's full on, not just, okay, like this seems right. This is, this is it. I'm part of the, the church. I am, I want to be a deacon. I want to be in this system. Adding that LeBeouf was inspired to consider the di- diaconate while filming Abel Ferrara's Padre Pio. We're going to read about Padre Pio in just a second. In the 2020 biographical film, LeBeouf plays Padre Pio, an Italian priest who received the stigmata. If you know anything about stigmata, it's just this occult thing that happens. Again, I don't mean to ruffle your feathers, but look, gosh, go to my episode on the image of the beast in the end time series when I talk about the passion of the Christ and the woman <clears throat> who wrote a book. Gosh, I forget her name. I forget her name now. She's some nun, but starts with an E. It was in the 15th century that George or uh, Mel Gibson basically played the movie off of this book. This book is this, like this satanic book, basically of these crazy things. I mean, it's just crazy. Again, I'm not trying to ruffle feathers, but you got to learn where your things come from. And especially with the occult film industry, which has always been there to deceive the masses one way or another, left or right, dark or light. These things are by design. The, the person who wrote the book that Mel Gibson based his film off of was demonically possessed, without question, demonically possessed. And one of the manifestations of that was this whole stigmata thing and, and floating above the ground and all of these crazy demonic things. But this is what poor Shia has joined. And look at him just being just totally initiated into this system. I really feel sorry for him, man. I really do. I'm, I'm sorry to say it. Let's watch another video. Shia LaBeouf has been totally and completely Christ-pilled. Check this out. When Christ I look Christ on the cross, I think, mm, is that a joyful man? As he bleeds out and dies on a cross for humanity, is that man joyful? And I think the answer is yes. That even in his suffering, that's what Christ represents for me meaningful suffering Christ is in maximum joy in that moment if you can tap into how you can use your suffering to help other people that is maximum maximum joy I always thought joy was oh I get this and then I'm happy or I do this and then I'm happy or I get her and then I'm happy or I make that and then I'm happy or they respect me and then I'm happy or I always thought happiness was to be acquired by the things I would gain if I knew early on that happiness actually is in me offering all of my suffering up for other people then I maybe would have lived my life differently so Benny Johnson, by the way, who I'm not going to cover in this, but he's another figure in all of this that is very influential with all of the pop culture Christianization that's happening. He says of Shia LaBeouf becoming a Catholic that he got Christ-pilled. Do you see the problem with that? Hopefully you do. Because he's basically promoting what Shia LaBeouf did as the truth. Oh, there you go. You went to Catholicism. Oh, you got Christ-pilled, bro. You got Christ pilled. No, you got religion pilled, bro. You got religion pilled. But of course, Benny Johnson is one of those people that's part of this alternative side of the media that's rising. The clean cut, reasonable sounding, charming side that is very seductive and has some reasonable things to say for sure, especially in comparison to the left. But in the end, it's leading you astray. Shia LaBeouf did not get Christ pilled. He got religion pilled, and we should pray for him that he does get, quote-unquote, Christ pilled. But another, another, an interesting thing that Shia brings up here, which again, you have to have discernment, Fennec Fox, suffering, the way he points at suffering, of course, we are told throughout the scriptures to count it all as joy, that you know we are being conformed to the image of Christ. Of course, Christ suffered and died. All of these things are true, but... The way that Catholicism shapes that into its own workspace religion is through the denial of the self. It's through ascetism. 
And you'll see soon enough, especially considering he was initiated with the movie that he played of this Padre Pio, who's all about denying the self, you know, Catholic Catholicism, they used to do like flogging themselves and, you know, fasting, fasting for just ever and ever going to monasteries, denying marriage. All these things are not of God, people. Denying the flesh does does nothing for you in terms of, I mean, it can help, but it's not the way to God. Faith is the way to God. Denying the flesh is ascetism, and it, it doesn't do anything for the flesh. You're warned against it, actually. So, be open eyes when you hear these types of things, especially considering that he converted to Catholicism, and the idea that you got to suffer, and that's that's your purpose. you got to channel your suffering. Well, of course, there's some truth there. I'm not going to deny that. But suffering from the from the Catholic perspective is very different. And if you know your history, uh, that's, that's just very different, ultimately, because they, they have created a religion of ascetism and self-denial that is not based on anything. It's not based on anything other than teachings of men. Padre Pio. Let's read about Padre Pio. Pio of Petr- Petrolcina, born in the 19th century. Why they know him as Padre Pio? or Father Pius, was an Italian Capuchin friar, priest, stigmatist, and mystic. Hmm. So now we're dealing with mysticism. He is venerated as a saint in the Catholic Church, of course, celebrated on the 23rd of September. Pio joined the Capuchins at 15 and spent most of his religious life in the convent of San Giovanni Rotondo. So somebody that had no life as a male, no life within the world, just being amongst other men, which, if you know anything about those monasteries, has been a lot, especially the Catholic Church. Who knows what went on in there? But anyway, moving on. He was marked by stigmata, marked, it's an interesting word, by stigmata in 1918, leading to several investigations by the Holy See. Despite temporary sanctions imposed by the Vatican, his reputation kept increasing during his life, attracting many followers to San Giovanni Rotondo. Again, this is just invented dialectics within the snake. The snake, remember, you 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 know your history, like the Jesuits were banned and then they came back. But they, they're all working for the same person, man. These are just dialectics. When you see these types of, oh, he was persecuted by the Catholic Church. Well, no, it's not exactly what it seems like. Moving on. He was the founder of the Casa Soluviano de la Sofertanza, a hospital built near the convent of San Giovanni Rotondo. After his death, his devotion continued to spread among believers all over the world. So after he died, people devoted to him even more, meaning he became an idol, not a martyr. He was beatified on 2nd May 1999 and canonized on 2002 in June by Pope John Paul II. His relics, i.e. body parts that the Catholic Church keeps around so you can idolize them and worship them, are exposed in the sanctuary of St. Pilo de Pietrocina, next to the convent of San Giovanni Rotondo, now a major pilgrimage site. Death cult. Catholicism is a death cult, and you have to realize it. And again, I don't mean to offend anybody, but this is the truth. These are pagan things where people are going to pay homage to body parts of dead people, which aren't even confirmed for those people, by the way. But anyway, that's another story. Let's move on. On behalf of the Holy Office, Gemelli re examined Pio in 1925, writing a report in April 1926. This time, Pio allowed him to see the wounds. So he's being examined for his stigmata. Gemelli saw, as it's caused the use of a corrosive substance, Pio had applied himself to these wounds. Uh-oh. Somebody investigated, and it seems that he was hurting himself in order to provide this particular story. The Jesuit Festa had previously tr- tried to question Gemelli's comments on stigmata in general. Gemelli responded to his criticism in his report and resorted to responding to his knowledge of self-inflicted wounds. He therefore clarified his statements about the nature of Peel's wounds. Quote, anyone with experience in forensic medicine, above all in variety by by sores and wounds that self-destructive soldiers were presented during the war, can have no doubt that these were wounds of an erosion caused by the use of caustic substance. The base of the sore and its shape are in every way similar to the sores observed in soldiers who procured them with chemical means. So he mutilated himself in order to to say, look, I'm so holy. I mean, we're talking about people that are living unusual lives. 
15 years old, you're, you're committed to a, a monastery or a convent. You're getting into mysticism. Again, if you know all the abuse that's happened in the Catholic Church and in religion in general, but especially in the Catholic Church, you're dealing with somebody that's very messed up. I'm sorry to say it, but this is the, this is the thing. Religion, personal views. Pio was a strong proponent of weekly confession, descri describing it as the soul's path. Of course, because you were in a works-based religion and you have to do something in order to be saved. And if you don't keep doing it, then you're dirty and you're guilty and you, you're suffering and you have to be punished. This is the religion of Catholicism, to which Shia LaBeouf converted, let's remind you, he wants to be a deacon, and to which Benny Johnson says, he got Christ-pilled. Hmm. Benny Johnson probably doesn't really know much about Padre Pio or Catholicism. Or maybe he does, and maybe he's a Jesuit operative. Who knows? Pio established five rules for spiritual growth, which included weekly confession, daily communion, spiritual reading, meditation, which meditation, again, if you've studied the spiritual exercises of the Jesuits, and mysticism, Fennec Fox, that's a Fennec Fox moment, and frequent examination of one's conscience. This is really not too much different than the Jesuit exercises. He taught his spiritual followers that suffering is a special sign of God's love. Does that sound familiar to what Shia LaBeouf was saying? Now, again, I, this is why I feel so bad for Shia. When you have to take on a role, you literally have to become that person. You have to like erase your personality and you get so involved that it's impossible not to be transformed when playing a role. He has been initiated into the Catholic Church through an occult, an occult basically event of, of filming this movie. He's basically been initiated because he's quoting exactly what Padre Pio says. You're not thinking for yourself, dude. You are quoting the role that you took on of a guy who faked stigmata, who is a mystic, who had never lived a normal life anyway, who's probably not a born again Christian, very likely. Anyway, for it makes you, quote, resemble his divine son in his anguish in the desert and on the hill of Calvary. Now, of course, we should embrace our suffering. Absolutely. But life is also good. God, when God created the world, he looked upon it and he said it was good. It's good to spend time with friends, to have dinner, to enjoy, to go out in nature, to enjoy the good things that God has blessed you with. Not to focus completely on the suffering all the time and to just beat yourself over the brow and just, I got to keep suffering. It's a gift from God to suffer. Yeah. Sometimes when you suffer and you realize, okay, I, this is a season I have to go through, then yeah, go with it and find grace. Thank God for all the things he's given you. Try to see the opportunity. But this is, this is a different perspective. This is a different kind of perspective. Pio became exceedingly pessimistic about the state of the world towards the end of his life. Interesting. When asked what awaited in the world in the future, Peel replied, can't you see that the world is catching on fire? In his last three years, he began to withdraw further from life, feeling unworthy and unsure of his salvation. Well, I wonder why. Because Catholicism has done you a huge disservice. Because you put your faith in meditation, confession every day, doing this, doing that, rather than the perfect work of Christ on the cross. Peel frequently asked his supervisor, Give me the obedience to die. Gosh, what a sad life. What a sad life. And this man, Shia, had to take on this role. And now he wants to be a deacon in the Catholic Church. So sad. I mean, if that doesn't make you sad, I don't know what will, because it is extremely sad. All right, now we're going to get some into some good stuff. We're getting spicy now with some of these false signs and wonders. This is now my second tab of things, and it's going to be some good stuff because ultimately we looked at people. We're also going to look at events and things that are happening to bring this image of the beast into fruition. And of course, we start with The Passion of the Christ, which is not the original movie, but the one that's coming out very soon. The Passion of the Christ Resurrection, a sequel to The Passion of the Christ focuses on the events that occurred three days between the crucifixion and the resurrection when Jesus Christ descended into Abraham's bosom to preach, let's see what it says, to preach and resurrect the Old Testament saints. Now, all right, let me continue. This film is the sequel of Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ. 
focuses on the 24 hours encompassing Jesus' passion, of course. So this is a sequel of the original movie that's coming out. And it's coming out pretty soon. I don't know when it's I think it's coming out either 2024 this year or the next year. But it's coming out. And if you are familiar with the, the original Passion of the Christ, of the Catholic indoctrination that's happening, of the false Christ that they are presenting, which is really the Antichrist that they wanted to come into the world, maybe they're going to stage the coming of a second Christ, a false Christ. Who knows? I've talked about that possibility. But that movie is loaded with occult symbolism. Just wicked movie. Unfortunately, it's just sad that they've turned the, the passion of the Christ, the story of Jesus Christ into this occult indoctrination. But here comes now the installment of that, the resurrection, the, the coming to life of what exactly? It's not the Jesus of the Bible because you're not basing your movie off Jesus of the Bible. You're basing your movie off of occult things. So, isn't it interesting that now with all of these things shifting, dark to light, that this movie is coming out? Remember that Hollywood is there to announce what's coming. Predictive programming. You thought the left was the only one that was doing predictive programming with all the things that, that are being debunked now in the movies and say, look, these people predicted it 50 years ago. Well, yeah, guess what? The right is also doing that. So when you see a movie like this that's being timed right with the election with things going, celebrities coming back to God, to religion, converting to Catholicism. There's a reason for it. Keep that in mind. Now, Martin Scorsese. Let's read about Martin Scorsese because he's an interesting fellow too. Martin Scorsese meets Pope Francis. This is in last year, May 2023, announces film about Jesus. I have responded to the Pope's appeal to artists in the only way that I know by imagining and writing a screenplay for a film about Jesus. So if you don't know, the, the, the Pope basically called this conference, oh, I think it talks about it later, so I'm going to read about it. Scorsese announced on Saturday during a Rome conference at the Vatican, according to multiple reports. And I'm about to start making it, the director added, suggesting that this could be his next film. Also on Saturday, before attending the conference, the titled the Global Aesthetics of the Catholic Imagination. This is the conference. The Global Aesthetics of the Catholic Imagination. That was the conference. Bringing all the people who are influencing culture. What do we want Catholicism to look like? What is this new thing that we're bringing everybody into? What is it, people? And let's let's brainstorm. Let's, of course, they already have a plan. They're going to give the plan. And people like Martin are going to follow that plan. They're responding to the call, but this is it, the global aesthetics of the Catholic imagination. Scorsese and his wife, Helen Morris, met Pope Francis during a brief private audience at the Vatican. And that's that. There's another article about it. Martin Scorsese says, New Jesus film aims to take away the negatives of organized religion. Do you see what's happening? I hope you do. Martin Scorsese is following up his triumphant true crime epic Killers of the Father of the Moon with an 80-minute film about Jesus designed to, quote, take away the negatives associated with organized religion just in time, just in time for the image of the beast to be completed and for people to, the we the people to conquer the left and to adopt organized religion. Because, hey, why not? It's way better than communism. We want God. We want God back in our life. Well, since Martin Scorsese's film seems to paint religion in such a great way without all those negative aspects of history, gosh, who would want those? Maybe that's the right truth, is Catholicism. Well, look, look, Benny Johnson's endorsing it. Look, Shia LaBeouf is endorsing it. Look, Jordan Peterson's a Catholic. Look, J.P. Sears is even Catholic. Look, Andrew Tate is a Catholic. It must be the truth. Do you see how all this works? It's all coming together, folks. It really is. In an interview with Los Angeles Times, Scorsese explained the thinking behind the project. An adaptation of A Life of Jesus by writer Shushuku Endo, a Japanese Catholic whose 1966 novel Silence was previously adapted by Scorsese. So it's not from the Bible. So there you go. It's, it's just a film about Jesus. And whenever you're making it not from the Bible, even when you're making it, quote, from the Bible, like The Chosen claims to be, you run into some serious challenges to be faithful to the text and you're not distracting from the text. This is the danger with any of such productions. But anyway, Scorsese said he was, he and his writing collaborator, Kent Jones, had finished the screenplay and were swimming in inspiration 
for a film reportedly set largely in the present day that focuses on Jesus' core teachings in a way that explores the principles but doesn't proselytize. So a Christ that pleases everybody doesn't make you feel guilty, doesn't try to convert you, just presents these nice things that can bring people back to organized religion. Scorsese said, I'm trying to find a way to make it more accessible and take away the negative onus of what has been associated with organized religion. Now, of course, he, he's not going to say Catholicism, but it's really, you got to read between the lines. It's Catholicism that is the issue. And yeah, Catholicism has twisted the word of God, has murdered people for not obeying it, has tortured them, has infiltrated countries and taken over them, has demanded obedience. It's the counterfeit that the Bible warns you about. Yeah, there's a lot of negatives, I'd say, that can't be just washed away with a movie based on some Catholic's view of Jesus and his book. But if you have no discernment, and you're like most people, you will take that movie and say, oh, this is the truth, and this is exactly what's going to happen because the Bible warns you about it. The director, 81, added, right now, religion, you say that word and everyone is up in arms because it's failed in so many ways, acknowledging the dark. But that doesn't mean necessarily that the initial impulse was wrong. Let's point you to the light. Let's get back. Let's just think about it. You may reject it, but it might make a difference in how you live your life. It might make you a little better. Kind of like how Jordan Peterson and J.P. Sears, do you see a pattern, folks? Do you see it? It's a good thing. It's, you know, it might make a difference in your life. Do you know what the only difference that really matters is whether you're saved or not? Are you saved? When Jesus comes and you have to stand before him, will you, like at the Passover, have the blood of the lamb covering you or not? It's a yes or no deal. It's not an investigation. It's not a measurement like the Egyptians used to have with the feather and the scales. And if you're you know, if your good works outweigh the bad, and if not, you get eaten by the alligator or whatever. It's not like that. It is, do you have the blood of the lamb covering you? That's the difference. Not, gosh, I have more family-oriented values, or, hmm, you know, I'm realizing all these values because there's so much evil in society. Conservatism is actually good because Christianity is good. No, what matters is, are you saved or not? Moving on. Let's get back. Let's make, let's think about it. Yada, yada, yada. Even in rejecting it, don't miss it offhand. That's all I'm talking about. So again, it's, if you understand that in the 1960s, Vatican II changed its, its tactics from the Ignatius stomping on the Luther, holding the Bible, and forcefully defeating him, to, hey, we need to, to reunite with our separated brethren. The charismatic movement. Hollywood, all of these different signs and wonders and things that are happening today, which you will see, I'm going to document most of them. All of these things are seductions designed to warm you up to the mother church because they realize that being forceful only pushes people towards the gospel. So they're going to counterfeit the light and bring you back into this one world system through people like Scorsese. This is from the Vatican News. A hundred young Africans trained to be faith influencers. Boy, isn't that interesting. Providing young Africans with the tools and knowledge necessary to effectively use digital platforms to spread the faith and the word of God, i.e. Catholicism, is the objective of a six-month online training course which will bring together more than a hundred young people from 52 African countries. Seven course modules have been organized by the Pan-African Catholic Theology and Pastoral Network. Boy, Africa is ready to flip from dark to light, man. Of course, they also have a lot of charismatic and hyper NAR type of people over there anyway. So this is all Catholic territory ready to be primed and flipped to this new system. In partnership with several institutions, including the Vatican Dicastery for Communication. Africa is a continent in full transformation. They tell you right from the get-go. Of course it is. Notably due to the growth of its population and the sharp increase of the number of Catholics, the majority of whom are young people. In order to become actors in this transformation of their society, these young people need solid training. Of course they do. They need learning against learning. Covering all areas regarding faith, young people can be missionary influencers on social media's digital platforms. This is according to Father Stan Chu Lo, 
initiator of a six-month online training course for young African influencers. This is the new battleground, folks, is the wide world of the internet with digital influencing and faith influencers. Here's another one, actually, as an example of faith influence. Let's see. Father Mike, this guy is super popular. We're going to read. Or actually, we're going to listen. Let's see. But in so many ways, expectations are a killer of joy. They are a thief of peace and they even rob us of the presence of God. Here's what I mean. How many times have you gotten into a situation and you're like, but it isn't what I expected it to be. And so I have less joy now. God is in your midst. God is in my midst. God is in the midst of us in the realities of daily life. And if we say, but it's not how I expected this Lent would go. It's not how I expected this life would go. It's not what I said yes to. We're not only going to miss out on God's will, we're going to miss out on God. If we're willing to put aside our expectations of what things might look like, then we will be free to simply accept reality as his will. To say yes, not just to the circumstances, but to say yes to him. Because I can't know what I'm saying yes to, but with Jesus, I can know who I'm saying yes to. Gosh, isn't that inspiring? I mean, it's just fascinating, really. He, he said some good things. If you just take them for what they are, they are some good things. But then he slides in the whole Lent thing. He's wearing a Catholic representational outfit. I don't know if he's a, what rank he is, but he's Father Mike. He's a very popular, influential figure. He's very charismatic. He's very good looking. It, this is the new thing, folks. Faith influencing, the Christianization of culture, really the Catholicization of culture where he gives you a little truth and gosh, Father Mike, man, you seem so reasonable, Father Mike. Way more reasonable than all these liberal influencers that were leading me astray. Father Mike, maybe you're right. Where, well, let me learn more about Father Mike. Oh, he's he's a Catholic? Well, I wonder what Catholics are like. Let me go to a Catholic church and maybe get into the Catholicism. Maybe that's the truth. Do you see how this works? Most people don't have discernment because most people have been deceived by the left on purpose to rip them away from God so that then the right, i.e. the militant Catholics, can come in with their agenda of seduction and conversion and you know all these little false signs and wonders to pick up the destruction that the left has given people and deceive them and offer them the solution. This is how this entire thing works over and over again. Here's another one, Life Surge, if you know what this is about. Gosh, this is just another crazy thing, false sign and wonder. Look at these fresh faces of your conservative Christian nationalists. Ed Milet, I, I went to Ed Milet to see Ed Milet in a, uh, like a personal growth conference when I used to be all involved in personal growth and personal development. What is a person like this doing at a supposedly Christian conference? All these people are, look, they're just, they're hip, they're clean cut. The light, gosh, so much light. Look at all these people. They have uh, Tim Tebow, you know, famous football figure. Nick Vucicic, he's uh, quadriplegic. Of course, he's got an inspiring story, but these people are giving you some truth, but then leading you towards a materialistic, worldly faith. They don't have the truth of the gospel. They're not teaching you the truth of the gospel. Look, they even have Jonathan Rumi. Jesus is there. You can go watch Jesus. You know, your hero from The Chosen. All this stuff is designed for a purpose, folks. This is the new thing. The, the old thing with Kenneth Copeland and uh, what's his name? Oh, gosh, I'm just having such a memory trouble today. All the prosperity people. Creflo Dollar. Um, gosh, I'm just having a... I can't remember their names. Right anyway, all the prosperity teachers that are very well known. Well, like Benny Hinn. That's the old school. That, that is the old system. Everybody has realized and exposed these people and they're, they're not as influential anymore. They're starting to, they're getting older. They're not as good looking. Now we need a new wave. This is the new wave. These fresh faced, young, mature, good looking, conservative, he's got a bandana, big beard. Yeah, you can trust him. He's a patriot. And all your heroes like Jonathan Rumi from The Chosen with his dramatic headshot is this, like, is this, is this Christianity? And of course it's not. This is, what is, what is Life Surge? Well, Life Surge is about 
why you should grow your resources, how to grow resources, how to leverage resources for kingdom impact. Kingdom impact is about fusing what people believe is the kingdom of God, which is a spiritual reality, into a material outcome. Building the kingdom. I'm building the kingdom. Well, what's the kingdom if it's a material thing? It's a Christian nationalist empire. You're building the image of the beast. And, of course, this is just one of many false signs and wonders that is being worked where? The United States, because the United States is the false prophet and the home of such things as, you know, uh, Life Surge and Hollywood and all this stuff. Mark Wahlberg shares Ash Wednesday message reveals daily routine that starts with prayer. Why is Mark Wahlberg on Fox and Friends? If you've noticed, Fox especially recently has been covering a lot of Catholic stories. A lot of he's they're propping people up from the Catholic religion and saying, look, these people are doing good. Be like them, follow them. They're cool. What are they up to? Oh, and they're cool. They're doing this Ash Wednesday thing. Maybe I should try it. Of course, my communism and my liberal woke attitudes are not going anywhere. Maybe I should get into this whole Catholic thing that these people seem so reasonable. They seem so happy. They're clean cut. They're way better than, than I am. Maybe I should do that Catholic thing they're doing. But why, why is Fox covering these things? Fox is supposed to be a news agency. Why is the news and media covering Catholic Lent? That should concern you. If it doesn't, then you need to learn about the image of the beast. Have you heard of Hallow, the prayer app? Try Hallow for free. Look at these photos. These people are just these seductive photos that are just like, gosh, they're so appealing. You have C.S. Lewis, you have music, you have Bible stories, you have meditations. You have Jonathan Rumi with his seductive glamour shot and his quote. You have endorsements from Fox News, which again is all about Catholic stuff, NBC, Forbes, the Wall Street Journal. It is the number one used prayer app in the world is Hallow. It's another thing. Hallow's Lent Pray 40 Community Prayer Challenge for 2024. So they have this Pray 40 Lent Challenge. Come and check it out. It's the Lent Challenge that we can all do together. And of course, it's being guided by all these different people like Father Mike Schmitz, which we just saw, Sister Mary Bernice, Mark Wahlberg. He's cool, right? He's in so many movies. Sorry for the noise if you're hearing it. Some helicopters flying over. Sister Miriam James. You don't know who she is, but she's cool. Oh, there's Jonathan Rumi, my hero from The Chosen. He's on the Catholic prayer app and he's guiding this challenge. See how it works? People used to do like stupid challenges, like workout challenges, or you know, see how many teaspoons of cinnamon you can have challenge. Now it's the prayer, the prayer challenge, the Lent challenge, the Eucharist challenge. Just check that out. See how they get you? This is this is the Catholicization of culture. And uh and what, what nothing it says pray 40 challenges. In 2023, the imitation of Christ inspired pray 40. We're gonna read about the imitation of Christ. Daily readings from the 15th century book written by monk Thomas Kempis were centered to the Lenten prayer challenge, meaning the Bible wasn't the center. It was this book, which we're going to learn about. The book which influenced the lives of countless saints over the centuries is equally powerful today. Let's see about the imitation of Christ. Very interesting little book. Kempis stresses the importance of solitude and silence. How undisturbed a conscience we would have if we never went searching after ephemeral joys nor concerned ourselves with affairs of the world. Because Kempis was a mystic. All of these people are mystics. Padre Pio, Kempis, St. Ignatius. I don't even want to call him a saint because he's not a saint. But Ignatius of Loyola, Hesychasm in Eastern Orthodoxy. It's all the same stuff. It's all the same mystical spirit. God does not command you to be a mystic to be transcending anything, to be doing various exercises and bouncing forward and backward, praying all day or secluding yourself. No, God commands you to be in the world and proclaim the gospel and to be in the world, not of the world, but in it. On the day of judgment, Kempis writes that a good and pure conscience will give more joy than all the philosophy one has ever learned. Fervent prayer will bring more happiness than a multi-course banquet. The silence will be more exhilarating than long tales, Holy deeds will be of greater value than nice-sounding words. On the day of judgment, none of those things will matter if your faith has not been placed in Christ. But if you're a Catholic, you think that all these things will help save you. Do you remember Padre Pio and his dying words? How he started to feel that he was losing his salvation? He was despairing. 
the reality that maybe he had been deceived, maybe snuck up on him. Who knows? Maybe he repented and God gave him grace. But either way, Padre Pio was definitely not happy with his life at the end. Kempis writes that if we have a clear conscience, God will defend us, and whomever God chooses to help, no man's malice can harm. Kempis writes that God's grace will be always be given to the truly grateful, and what is given to the humble is taken away from the proud. God's grace is given to the ungrateful. That's the whole point of the gospel, that he justifies the ungodly. You and I were not grateful for God before we were born again. God gave you that gift to see him as the, pro, as the provider, as the creator, as the judging king that is coming to the earth, and you repented, and then you trusted in God, and you, you became grateful as a result. God gave you that ability. He doesn't give you because you're grateful. This is the Catholic understanding, which is also very prominent in Protestant philosophy and theology, is this Arminian heresy that's been around for several centuries. Arminius was a, was a subordinationist, but that's another can of worms. Book three. Book three, entitled On Interior Consolation, is the longest among four books. This book is the form of a dialogue between Jesus and the disciple. Uh-oh, now we're starting to say stuff that Jesus said that he never actually said. Jesus says that spiritual progress and perfection consists in offering oneself to the divine will and not seeking oneself in anything either small or great in time or eternity. Did Jesus say that? Jesus didn't say that in the scriptures, but he said it in this book, apparently, and this is the book that Pray, the Pray 40 Challenge is based on, which is part of the world's, the number one world's prayer app, which is Hallow. Joseph Talenda summarizes the central theme of the third book with the teaching in chapter 56. Quote, my son, to the degree that you can leave yourself behind, to that degree will you be able to enter into me, meaning you must do something in order to be saved. And it's not only that, but it's based on degrees. That's even worse. Just as desiring nothing outside you produces internal peace within you, that's a non-dualist Buddhist philosophy. But anyway, so the internal renunciation of yourself unites you to God. This is mysticism. This is mysticism. Deny the outside world and then you get in tune with God. That is not what God tells you to do at all. Because the outside world, the created world is good. It's good to enjoy the world that God created. Enjoy food, enjoy other people, enjoy your pets, enjoy life. And of course, you're going to suffer too and find a way to glorify God during suffering. But nonetheless, this whole idea that you need to retreat inwardly to find God, that's not the gospel. That's mysticism. But if you are Mystery Babylon and you are a mystical religion, then this is what you use as your basis. Book four of the imitation, quote, on the blessed sacrament, is also in the form of a dialogue between Jesus and the disciple. Kempis writes that in the sacrament, spiritual grace is conferred. The soul's strength is replenished and the recipient's mind is fortified and strength is given to the body debilitated by sin. This is talking about the Eucharist, which I have a whole study on that I highly behoovingly, is that even a word, recommend you to go and watch because transubstantiation is about as satanic as you can get. And again, I don't mean to hurt anyone's feelings, but it's the truth. To receive the sacrament, Jesus says, make clean the mansion of your heart. Did Again, did Jesus say this stuff? No, he didn't. Shut out the whole world and all its sinful, di sinful din and sit as a solitary sparrow on the housetop and in bitterness of your soul, meditate on your transgressions. Jesus says that there is no offering more worthy, no satisfaction greater for the washing away of sins than to offer oneself purely and completely to God at the time of the body of Christ is offered in the Mass in the communion of God. This is not being guided to you by the Holy Spirit to write such a thing, because it is a complete contradiction to what Jesus actually said. So now the question is, what spirit is guiding this? And that is, the answer is the spirit of Antichrist that is uniting the world into one common culture and understanding. Because again, this book, The Imitation of Christ, is regarded as the most important devotional book in Catholic Christianity and is the most widely read devotional book next to the Bible. This book is incredibly influential, almost as much as the Bible. Remember what the Protestants said? The learning against learning, how we got to make, we got to use the printing press. We got to use what they're using, but use it towards our advantage. 
and discredit the Bible, diffuse, distract, delude the message. Learning against learning, man. That's what it's all about. Apart from the Bible, no Christian book has been translated into more languages than The Imitation of Christ. Isn't that profound? I didn't really even know about this book until I read about it. It has also been admired by many others, both Catholic and Protestant. Hmm. The Jesuits give it an official place among their exercises. Isn't that interesting? Kempis Imitatio Christi was in close parentage with the Ignatius of Loyola, the devotional Moderna movement. Didn't I tell you that these two things are pretty much the same thing? And also it was affirmed and practiced by St. Francis de Sales, profoundly influencing his introduction to the devout life. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, listed the imitation among the works that influenced him and his conversion. Gosh, that's just such an embarrassing point for Protestants because Wesley has some great things to say, but again, he's a human being, he's flawed. Now, of course, I don't doubt that God will use all things for the good for those he has chosen to save, Romans 8, 28 through 30. Absolutely, God cannot lose. He uses everything perfectly. But does that mean that we should be like, oh, this book is great. Yeah, just put it out in the world. Sure, base a whole app on this. Base movies on it. No, because it's an antichrist spirit-driven book. So I don't know the state of John Wesley. He certainly wrote some good things. But again, this Protestants need to realize these types of historical pieces of evidence because they're important. Let's look at Pure Flix. Here's another one. Pure Flix, if you Google Pure Flix, Pure Flix is the is the light where the Netflix was the dark. It's a basically a, a streaming service, but for Christian stuff. Then you have Angel Studios. Angel Studios streaming free. They have Christian movies. We're going to see some stuff that they put on The Chosen. It's this, this new thing that's coming up. The last like 20 years. You had the old thing, the liberal left, but now we have the new thing. We have Pure Flix, we have Angel Studios. All these different things. Look at Angel. This is Liz Tabish from Angel Studios with her empty tune occult necklace. The perfect gift. And she's your hero from The Chosen. You know, you can relate to her. I think she plays Mary Magdalene or something. But, uh, you know, they have all these little things. Of course, Catholics love their physical things and they play to the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh. And, of course, if you know anything about the occult, they always have what? Two layers of meaning, the exoteric and the esoteric. What is on the outside, exo, like exoskeleton, and esoteric, what's on the inside. The meaning that they tell you with the cute people like this, with Liz Tabish, and she's, oh my gosh, I've got this necklace, and look at me, and it represents all these wonderful things to me, and it's Jesus' tomb, and it's resurrection, when really, this is a vesica Pisces. If you know what vesica Pisces is, it's two interlocking circles. If I could do this... <laughs> Two interlocking circles. It's an occult, dualistic, mystical symbol. And of course, what does it actually say? Look at it. Dark to light. Dark to light. Now, of course, the true dark to light is Jesus. He went from death to life. But the counterfeit is going to be going from dark to light throughout the world. The kings of the earth will give their power to the woman riding the beast. That's going to be the counterfeit dark to light. But this is the empty tune necklace, and again, they're just putting these things out there for the thing that's coming. This is another movie from Angel Studios. Cabrini, based on a true story. This is a Catholic nun. And she's just, oh my gosh, these movies are so seductive. They're so well made. Catholicization of culture. And they have all these books that you can buy. It's all about the Catholic. They're wandering after the beast. What does the Bible tell you in Revelation 13? That the beast receives a mortal wound, but then it heals and people marvel after the beast. They wander after it. This is wandering after the beast. One, oh my gosh, all these false signs and wonders. Look at the beast. It's so amazing. Where is this happening, by the way? In the United States. The United States is the false prophet working these false signs and wonders saying, look, isn't Catholicism amazing? Gosh, the lives of these people were just so pious and so interesting. We're going to make all these productions for you to fall in love with. We're going to have these characters like Liz Tabish and uh, what's his name from The Chosen and Mark Wahlberg and all these charming people. They're just so amazing. Gosh, this must be the, the real deal. I mean, if Jordan Peterson says that it's the most sane thing ever in history, as sane as you can get, then it must be true. Gosh, I hope people wake up. 
We don't have too much more, but we have a few to go. After Death, Angel Studios. A gripping feature film that explores what happens after we die. Hmm. Based on what? Let's see. Based on real dear, real near-death experiences conveyed by scientists, authors, and survivors. Does this equal the word of God? Or are these subjective experiences? Now, I have an afterlife series that at the time of this episode, maybe you're watching it in the future. I encourage you to watch it. If you're watching this episode when it came out, then my afterlife series is not out yet. But it will be soon. Don't worry. We're going to cover all of this stuff in detail because the afterlife is another point that Mystery Babylon is bringing people back to her with things like this, after death, what happens? Oh my gosh, all these visions and near death experiences and bringing you into this common understanding of reality where the Bible's very clear. There's death and then comes judgment. You die, it's like going to sleep, hopefully if it's not a painful death, but Either way, it's like going to sleep, and then when you wake up, the next thing you know, you're resurrected. Now, the thing then is whether you're resurrected to glory or to shame. Did you have faith in Jesus? That's all that matters. From the New York Times bestselling authors who brought you the titles like 90 Minutes in Heaven, Imagine Heaven and To Heaven and Back emerges a cinematic peak beyond the veil that examines the spiritual and scientific dimensions of mortality, inviting us to wonder, is there life after death? Yes, let's wonder. Because if there is, what does that mean? You must pray for the dead. There must be purgatory. There must be saints who are alive and you can pray to. Do you see how all of this connects and why this is such an important lie to maintain? Because if you realize that the Bible's true and it says you die and then there's judgment, God is not the God of the dead. He's not a God of the underworld. He's a God of the living, meaning those who are going to be resurrected. But if you realize that, then you realize that praying to Mary is nonsense, praying to saints is nonsense, praying for the dead is nonsense. Expecting there to be a change after you die, like purgatory, is nonsense. All of these things are nonsense. It breaks the spell. That's the point. But if you believe, then they can keep weaving their spells and spells and entrance you and to bring you back to the mother church. Fascinating. Netflix. Did you know that Netflix has a series on Catholic relics called Mysteries of the Faith? Even Netflix, who is the liberal, dark side of things, has a series called Mysteries of the Faith on Catholic relics. Fascinating stuff. It really is. The Catholicization of culture. The Thorn Spring 2024 live tour. If you've seen this, I hope we're going to watch a... I think there's a video maybe somewhere I can watch. Let's see. Can we watch a video? Watch show trailer. Okay, the thorn, this is a, let's read about it first. The thorn tells the epic story of God's love for the world and the spiritual battle for humanity. Remember that battle that uh, Candace, uh, Candace, or uh, what's her name? Um, dang it, what's her name? You know, Candace, uh, Candace and Andrew Tate. Candace o Olson, Candace Owen? Candace Owens, I think, yeah. I'm really bad with names today, anyway. Candace Owens, I think, and Andrew Tate. Oh, yeah, we're, we're in the spiritual battle right now. Yeah, it's true. We are in a spiritual battle. But the spiritual battle is not between what you see as the dark Satanist left versus the good, charming, good-looking, clean-cut, reasonable guys. The spiritual battle, which has already been won, is between the deception that's coming and God's elect. God's elect, which some of them have not come to faith yet because the plan of salvation is not yet complete. It's still unfolding. There are still some elect that need to come to Christ. Those people are being fought by the devil, and he's trying everything he can to deceive as many people as he can. But, of course, God's plan is not going to be foiled. Those people who he has chosen to save and reserve for himself will be saved. But nonetheless, spiritual battle. Make sure you have the right context. Often described as Cirque... <laughs> Often described as Cirque du Soleil meets the passion of Jesus. God, two pagan things in this show. This is what it's often described as. The Thorn is an immersive show featuring live music, drama, aerial acts. Who is the, who is the source of drama, by the way? Do you remember? Aerial acts, movement arts, modern dance, and big visual effects. Is this what God wants you to have? To lust after these things? The lust of the eyes? What does it say? Faith comes by what? Seeing theatrical productions? No. Uh, being motivated by visual performances of various kinds? No. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. That's the whole point. 
And this is why this is a false gospel. This is, remember, going back to the learning against learning. What was the goal? To discredit the Bible and to put it to the side. One of the, now that we're in the modern age with technology, these things are more and more like visual things to get you to lust after visual productions that have nothing to do with the Word of God. Cirque du Soleil meets Passion of the Christ. Thank you, but no thank you. Are you kidding me? But this is what people want. And this is the new thing that's on the horizon. They have forgotten the word. And so there's going to be a lot of false converts because hearing comes by the word of God, not by theatrical productions. But this is what's coming, folks. This is the image of the beast. Let's watch the show trailer. Here it is. Look at this. I'm not even putting my headphones on. I'm just going to experience the passion of Jesus. As you've never seen it before. Look at this. I mean, this is just crazy. It's 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 a theatrical Cirque du Soleil, Passion of the Christ type of live theater production, which again, if you know who put on the theaters of Europe, who started all of this. Look at this. Flames, fire, pizzazz. It is the ultimate seduction. The national phenomenon. Yeah, it is a national phenomenon in the United States because the United States is the false prophet. Visceral, emotional, immersive, breathtaking, thrilling, epic, spectacular. The Thor. <gasps> and of course, you see their little dark to light. Did you see that? I wonder if I can. Yeah, I can't go back. They should have a thing here, though. Where's the logo? I'll show you. Look at this logo. Dark to light, baby. Same thing, dark to light. You, you, you got to tell you <clears throat> what they're up to. They have to. But this is the new thing. The Thorn, three minutes with John Bolin. <clears throat> Lisa M. Henley interviews John Brolin, executive producer and creator of The Thorn, about the film's upcoming theatrical release. Today, I continue my ongoing series of conversations with awesome storytellers creating fantastic projects as I'm joined by John Brolin, the executive producer of The Thorn and creator of The Thorn. So... She's interviewing him, and let's see what he says. Question, are there any additional thoughts or comments you would like to share? As a father of five children and the son of devout Catholic parents, so he's Catholic, the people who are putting on the thorn are who? Catholics. I want to thank CatholicMom.com for all they are doing to encourage families. Yada, yada, yada. Encourage them to develop their passion in ways that they will spread the light and love of God into the world, i.e. to spread Catholicism to the world. We are called to be Jesus' hands and feet to every corner of culture. Yes, if you mean the Great Commission. No, if you mean Catholicism. But this is it. These people are in positions of influence and power. And the United States is ripe for the picking because it has been liberalized on purpose so that they can accept the image of the beast. And everything is here. The Hollywood, the false signs, the, the apps... The mega churches, the prosperity preaching, it's ripe for the picking, folks. It's ripe for the picking for this thing to come to fruition. Here's another thing. Again, I'm not going to put Jesus my headphones Christ on for on this one, but for this is, says Jesus Christ was displayed for the first time in history on the digital billboards in Times Square. Look at this. Now, again, I'm not at all doubting that God will use anything for the good and will convict the elect that need to still be convicted with something like this. But this is a false sign and wonder. Look at this. People are marveling after these things. Pretty soon you're going to see Mary and the saints and the Eucharist and all these things that are going to come more and more into the public sphere. People are like, oh my gosh. And people love it. You know why? Because they've been liberalized to death, especially in New York. New York is, you know, full of liberal craziness. And of course, this is a fresh... Thing. Look at this, false signs and wonders, man. These are wonders. Can you imagine? Look, just for a moment, let's be real. Look at this. Imagine if you were an ancient Hebrew or an ancient Israelite. Even today, look at people opening their mouths. They're marveling after these signs and wonders. Imagine if you were a Hebrew Israelite like Paul, and you were just seeing these things for the first time. You would say that this is like magic. This is literally a, a false sign and wonder, a miracle coming to pass. And we just take this for granted. Oh, it's just a billboard. Oh, it's just, no, it's not. This is a false sign and wonder that is being 
coming to pass. So again, these are signs. Of course, there's nothing wrong with putting the nativity up. People should know about Jesus. But people are associating visually enhancing things, visually enticing things, visceral things to Jesus, rather than hearing comes by the word of God. You don't see scriptural verses on there. Yeah, I think they had some, maybe like a little bit of language, but it's mostly the eyes, the visual. Yes, look at this light. Look at this angel appearing. Oh, look at this. Look at that. It's not trying to evoke repentance in you. It's trying to seduce you. This is the difference. Do you get it? Hearing comes by the word of God, because when you hear, you're convicted. If you see these productions and things, you're not convicted. I mean, maybe, of course, again, God will use everything for the good, so I don't doubt that. But the point is, hearing comes by the word, not by seeing productions. This is the, gosh, we'll end with this, but this is the He Gets Us Jesus Super Bowl that just happened with, with this woke stuff of, of people washing each other's feet and you know everybody's up in arms about it because there's some really woke messaging in all this stuff with with washing of the feet which again you know i've seen some memes like this before where they have jesus washing people's feet and basically he's washing like obama's feet he's washing trump's feet he's you know all these different positions that he's putting christ in it's like wait a minute do you realize that Jesus chose to wash specifically the apostles' feet and only their feet for a particular reason? Jesus didn't teach hate. Hate, that's a buzzword from the left. He washed feet. Who's, whose feet did he wash, though? He gets us, all of us, Jesus. I mean, this is just woke nonsense. But again, to the liberal left... This is the step that they need in order to accept the coming image of the beast. And, of course, the right is kind of saying, well, wait a minute, that's a little woke Jesus. And so it's getting people to talk and to debate and to discuss and to put this in the limelight, to put religion in the limelight, not the gospel. Of course, some people are standing for the gospel, which is good. But this is bringing Christianity, quote-unquote religion, really, into the culture. It's divisive, but it's designed to, to, to froth people up a little bit. The liberals need to take the step, to take an extra step towards Christian nationalism than the right conservatives need to. They're already there. They're just being primed through charismatic revivals and through all these other things where Louis looked at. The liberals need to, you know, to get a woke Jesus first, and then they're going to make the step towards a Christian nationalist system. They will. Don't worry. Everybody's going to be integrated. That's what the Bible tells you. But look... I hope that today has been informative. The words of God about the false prophet and all the signs and wonders are being fulfilled in our lifetime. They've been being fulfilled, but specifically in our lifetime. We will see all of these things come to pass and the image will be completed and the kings of the earth will give their power to the beast. The image is almost done, but a lot of dark to light kind of transformations are happening throughout the world. Politically, there's a lot of flipping from liberal to conservative. China, I have a whole episode on that with China being, you know, kind of a whole dark to light with the Catholicism in China is a fascinating case study in and of itself. Africa, we looked at Africa, we look at all these faith influence. This is the new thing, folks. Compare everything I just shared with you with now what I shared with you at the very beginning, with what God's word tells you about false teachers, false Christ, apostasy, falling away, deception, Love of many will grow cold, the image of the beast, obeying, you know, enforcing obedience, the kings of the earth giving their power to the woman, which is the Catholic Church. Put that all together, what do you get? What do you get is all this stuff that seems cool and good and, oh my gosh, it's visceral. That is the thing to worry about. Adam and Eve did not, I've said this again before and I've said it again, and I will say it again was what I mean to say. Adam and Eve did not fall because they were forced, they were threatened. They were intimidated. None of that stuff. They fell because they were seduced. They were seduced. The love of the flesh of the eyes and the love of this world, the pride of life is what John says in one of his letters. I think it's the first letter, but the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. This is what's coming. This is Satan's tactic in the beginning. 
and it's his tactic at the end. The devil's predictable, folks. You got to realize that the real big, the real evil is not the thing that you see that's obvious. It's the thing that looks almost right. Remember Charles Spurgeon? Discernment isn't knowing what's the difference between right and wrong because that's easy. Discernment is knowing what's the difference between right and almost right. There's a lot of almost right stuff that we looked at today. Some of it's more obvious than the, than the rest, but certainly there's a lot of almost right. America is going to export this culture that's happening in America with all these apps and movie studios, Pure Flix, Angel, Productions, Movies, Hollywood, Martin Scorsese, Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ. All this stuff is Christianizing culture, faith influencers, conversions of celebrities. It's going to happen here first, and then it's going to be exported to the rest of the world. And the rest of the world will then have a legal means to submit their authority back to the mother church more than it ever was ever before. It's going to be the same thing. It's just more all over the earth. Complete dominion is what the Bible says. At that point, this new system will begin to enforce worship. So if you don't know how it's going to do that, watch the Mark of the Beast episode in my series. Watch my Sabbath episode, the first episode. We'll tell you how. We're going to get into it in the Sabbath series as well. Um, of course, if you're watching this from the future, you can go back and watch the whole series. But I'm going to also document this history of Sunday laws and Sunday persecution because Sunday will very likely have to play in with this whole Mark of the Beast thing. It'll be about obedience and spiritual worship. It's not going to be a jib-jab. It's not going to be a QR code. It's not going to be... I mean, those things will probably be used in some way to enforce the Mark of the Beast. But the Mark itself is spiritual. It's who do you obey? Mark of God or Mark of the Devil? So I know this stuff can be scary. If you need some encouragement today, go to my website. Free, I have a whole section of encouraging audios that you can listen to, Bible-based things that are very important to balance out all of this negative stuff. It's not negative. It's just, look, this is the life we live. Be grateful that you're alive in such an amazing time where all these things are coming true. Because why? It means that Jesus will probably return in this generation. That's the good news. We are the envy of every Christian that has ever lived. It's truly a profound thought. Yes, all of this is crazy. I really, every time I cover it, I really can't believe that this is happening. I really, I say to myself, I really can't believe this. Of course I can believe it because God said it, but I can't believe it. You know, it's just crazy to see all these things truly coming to pass. But that means that Jesus is pretty close and there's a chance to see him and to be rescued by him, which is the dream of every Christian since day one. So rejoice and keep looking up.